The nuclear model of the atom, which is based on Rutherford's alpha scattering experiment, was somewhat disconcerting because it's inconsistent with the known behavior of accelerating charge. If you recall, the nuclear model basically suggests that you have a charged particle, an electron, going around a nucleus. And so anytime you have an electron moving around in circles, you have a charged particle moving around in circles, then you say that charged particle is accelerating. Okay, it's always changing direction. And if it's accelerating, then it's already known that if you have a charged particle that's accelerating, it's going to keep producing light. Okay, And so it's going to be losing energy. So it's going to emit light, we say. It's going to lose energy. And eventually, if this is your nucleus over here, that electron is going to crash into your nucleus in no time. Okay, It will almost immediately crash into the nucleus in no time. The atom, as we know it, cannot possibly exist if that were true. Now, you have to realize the nuclear model is still the currently accepted model of the atom. Okay. And so, we, basically, what we're saying here is that the prediction of an electron crashing into the nucleus is wrong. But that's a, a, an important prediction that needs to be addressed. Okay, why is it wrong? And it turns out we're going to need a new theory to describe theory to describe the behavior of very small particles. An early version of the nuclear model was proposed by Niels Bohr in an attempt to, to address the issue of electrons uh, of the prediction that electrons electrons would crash into the nucleus in no time. Niels Bohr basically assumed that there are stable circular orbits for an electron around the atom. And he, basically he said that in these specific orbits, the angular momentum has very well defined values. So MVR here, mass of the electron times speed of the electron times the radius of the orbit, so Bohr assumed that you have circular orbits, okay, so the radius of the orbit is r. So m times v times r is called the angular momentum. It's a measure of how fast the electron is moving around the nucleus. Bohr said for these stable orbits, these angular momentums cannot just, this angular momentum cannot just have any value. It's restricted to certain allowed values. And he said it must be a multiple of this number right here, h over 2 pi. h is Planck's constant, which has been discovered in several other experiments. When there were other experiments that at the time that were, that were anomalous and could only be explained by making certain assumptions, usually quantization. And, and that constant seems to be popping up everywhere. Okay, so... Uh, he said it's going to be a multiple of this Planck's constant, so it's going to be equal to 1 times Planck's constant, 2 times Planck's constant, 3 times Planck's constant, and so on. So by making this assumption, since the centripetal force is equal to the columbic force, okay, what's the centripetal force? If you have something orbiting the nucleus, okay, then there must, the reason it's going around in circles is there must be a force pulling it towards the center. And that force is called the centripetal force. And you learn in your physics the formula for centripetal force, okay, for, for something moving at constant speed v in a circle of radius r is given by this formula mv squared over r. That centripetal force must be equal to the Coulombic force, okay? We know that you have a positive nucleus and you have a negative electron, so there must be a force directed towards the nucleus, towards the center of the orbit. And the formula for the Columbic force is given by Coulomb's law. This some constant right here times the charge of the of the pro the pot, the nucleus. Z is the number of protons. E is the charge. E is one unit of charge, so 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Then the other E here is the charge of the electron, and R here is the radius of the orbit. Okay, epsilon here is a constant. It's called the permittivity of free space. And that's based on uh, and that's just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught here. That's just the constant for your Coulomb's law exp uh, expression, okay? So, anyway, since centripetal force is equal to the Columbic force and angular momentum is quantized, that quantization of angular momentum implies that the radius of the orbit and the energy are also quantized. That these will be satisfied 
quantization would only the quantization of angular momentum would only be satisfied if the electron is in certain specific radius and that also implies that the energy that the electron can have is also restricted there's restrictions on what those values can be so the the radius okay the allowed radii for the orbits so the orbits that are allowed would have a radius equal to n squared times a naught over z and a naught here turns out if you work this all out to be 52.9 picometers okay and z is the atomic number that's a number of protons in the nucleus so for the first orbit of hydrogen for example okay okay for n equals one the radius would be one squared times a naught over one so it's going to be a naught so the smallest possible radius for an electron according to the Bohr model is equal to 52.9 picometers the next allowed radius would be n for would be for n equals two would be r equals two squared times a naught over one and that's going to be four a naught and then the next allowed radius you should be able to show this easily would be nine a naught and so on so if you were to sketch the hydrogen atom okay you have a nucleus right here the first allowed radius is a naught okay that's for n equals one the next allowed radius would be 2a naught. I mean 4a naught, sorry. So four times bigger. So one, two, three, four, four times bigger. So this would be for n equals two. N equals two. The radius here is 4a naught. And then the next allowed radius, the next allowed orbit would have a radius of 9a0, this is for n equals 3. Okay, so those are the allowed radii for the for the orbits of an electron in a hydrogen atom in the Bohr model. Okay, so not only is the radius quantized, remember the word quantization or quantized means there's restrictions to the numbers, the values that it can have. So you say the uh, Bohr assumed that angular momentum m times v times r is quantized as a result of that quantization uh, uh, quantization of rate of the radius of the orbits is also quantized and the energy of the electron is also quantized there's also restrictions on the allowed energies for the electrons and it's given by this formula right here so it's negative r, or r is called the Rydberg constant, 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, times z squared. z is the atomic number. That's the number of protons in the nucleus. And n, again, is restricted to numbers, uh, uh, whole numbers 1, 2, 3, and so on. n is what you might call a quantum number, a number that's restricted to just specific values. You can't, have, you can't just have any value. Okay? So this is your what you call your quantum number. So what would be the allowed energies for an electron in a hydrogen atom? You would say, okay, the first allowed energy would be for n equals 1. The energy would be negative r. z squared is 1 squared over n squared, which is 1 squared. So it's just going to be negative r, where r is 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. The next allowed energy level would be equal to negative r times z squared which is one squared over two squared so negative r over four okay and then the third so this would be the energy of the electron in the second orbit negative r over four the energy of the electron in the first orbit so first orbit second orbit and for n equals three you should be able to show that the next allowed energy is going to be for which is for n equals 3 is going to be negative r over 9 3 squared is 9 okay so if you sketch that uh, at those allowed energy levels if you create what's called an energy level diagram so we have a sketch here energy scale the lowest allowed energy would be negative r okay so this is negative r and the next one is going to so your zero is somewhere up here okay 
Uh, by definition, zero energy refers to the energy when the, at the electron is infinitely far away from the nucleus, okay? Uh, so the next allowed energy level is negative r over 4, so this is negative r over 2, negative r over 4, so this one is negative r over 4. So, in other words, in order for an electron to go from the first orbit to the second orbit, it has to gain this much energy. Okay, it cannot have any energies in between. Okay, and so uh, the next allowed energy level is negative r over 9. So this is negative r over 4. Half of that is negative r over 8. So a little below that, or a little above that in this case, would be negative r over 9. Okay, and you can see as you go higher and higher in energy, this uh, uh, bigger and bigger orbits, these gaps between neighboring energy levels, adjacent energy levels, are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And, you know, and when n approaches infinity, you have infinitely large orbit, e would just be equal to zero. And the number we said e equals zero represents a situation where the electron is infinitely far away from the nucleus. The Bohr model was very successful in explaining the line spectrum of hydrogen. Uh, that means it's uh, the patterns in the light that's produced by a hydrogen lamp was very successfully explained by the Bohr model. And uh, the justification for the stable orbits was provided later, much later by de Broglie in nine, around 1927 with the notion that an electron behaves like a wave and so in order the reason why there's a restriction quantization in the orbit size is that the circumference of the orbit for the electron must be a multiple of the wavelength associated with the electron in order to avoid what's called destructive interference. We'll talk more about that later. But um, the problem with the Bohr model is that it only works for hydrogen and ions that have only one electron. So helium plus, helium remember has two electrons, if it loses one, you have helium plus that can that leaves one electron, or lithium plus, so that's three protons and one electron. So it only works for hydrogen and ions that have only one electron. And um, the notion that electrons are traveling in well-defined orbits around the nucleus is also inconsistent with what's called the uncertainty principle, which is implied by the wave nature of the electron. So while you're using the wave nature of the electron to justify the existence of stable orbits, it's also the wave nature of electrons also suggests that the notion of electrons defined traveling in well-defined orbits is not acceptable because uh, of the what we call the uncertainty principle that's a consequence of that wave nature. So ultimately Bohr's description of the nuclear model is incorrect. That's why we're not dwelling too much on it in this lesson. Okay, so we have to have a better theory to explain the nuclear model of the atom. So, the correct description of the nuclear model of the atom, like I said, the nuclear model is still the acceptable, accepted model for the atom, but the correct way to describe that nuclear model is based on a theory called quantum mechanics, okay? So, it's known as the, quantum, the modern, the, the correct nuclear model is the quantum mechanical or the wave, also known as the wave mechanical model for the atom. Quantization in this case will still arise as predicted by Bohr's theory, okay, Bohr's model, but this quantization naturally arises from the mathematics when you apply more basic assumptions or the more basic postulates of quantum mechanics. And so Bohr, if you recall, just assumed that something is quantized. Bohr said, let's assume it's quantized. Well, quantum mechanics starts off by making certain assumptions and then when we, you do the math, it, the, the idea, the notion of quantization, the restrictions uh, will arise from the math when you, when you impose the physical constraints on the, on the mathematics for the theory. Uh, 